support them yet. Do it for Everton, 20 and Wrexham. Every Sunday or Saturday, whatever, I always put a little bit of uh, a good luck to 20. Well, I find it ridiculous that I left there in 1986 and there's still people now in touch. Like nearly 50 years ago, you know what I mean? And it's, you must have done something right. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm quite proud actually. Yeah, this is actually people replying. FC20 have replied, no, thank you, Billy. So, I mean, that's, that's great. It's just a shame I can't get over there to watch in person, but I see it travels a little bit out the way this, uh, at this moment, so you support from afar. Rutten opnieuw aanzetten voor een Twente aanval. De buitenspelval knap omzeild door Birkendaal. Die verslikt zich bijna. En weet dan rode bij de eerste paal, Eskrot, schitterend. De voorzet is op maat en Eskrot komt zijn tweede treffer binnen. Twente leidt met 3-0. I, I try to update it because obviously I'm not on television. So you spend all day on your phone updating on um, whatever news channel while the match is on. Oh yeah, it's Daniel you well. I'll see you there at length, I'm speaking. It's heel lang geleden um, for Enschede, you know. But now it's, it's, God, how many years? Left in what, 80, 85, so 40 years. I forget most of the English I've learned. I left Middlesbrough and everyone was thinking, well, that's the end of the career. You just go in uh, to just see out the last elite years of your life. And then I really wanted to prove that I could still play a bit. 20 gave me the opportunity and I did it. So I'm very proud of my time there. If you think about it, I left Liverpool when I was 15 to go and live in, or 16 to live in Wales, to play for Wrexham. Uh, and I still am a scouser, I'm still a Liverpool lad. But um, people ask you, because I don't speak with a, a real Liverpool accent. And I've had people saying that you're a Woollyvach which means that you're from Runcorn or from Widnes or somewhere out of the city. I said, no, I was born in Garston. We were nicknamed the Mud Men because down where the shore is, the shoreline, it was all mud. This is Garston, yeah, this is Liverpool. We've been in Liverpool for oh, 10 minutes. If you go straight on, that's Garston Docks where my dad worked. My, my dad was a, a docker back there. My mum was a cleaner on the corner. I, I grew up, this is where I grew up. I was. A kid here, that's the wife's house there I used to live. And that's we were down there. These were terraced houses going into there, then all the way down to the bottom. Yeah, it still feels like home. Still got my family around here. Still got a lot of friends around here. Somebody would give you a cup of tea. I had to be determined because um, I, I didn't kick a ball till I was 14. But when my dad said to me, look, when you leave school, you're going to work on the docks with me. And I looked and I thought, there's no way I'm working on the docks. Uh, I'm determined now to actually make a, a go of this football thing. Uh, there was a thing back in, in England back in the day that, that if you wrote to the football club or your school wrote to the football club and said, we've got this player here, or you could write to the football club and say, well, I think I'm good enough to play for your team, your youth team. I want to be a professional footballer. You'd write to them and you get a reply from them. When I was uh, this delivery boy getting 50 pence a week, whatever, and I bought the football, started kicking the ball against the wall. So a week later, I bought some uh, writing paper, envelopes and some stamps the week after. 
and within probably nine to ten months, I'd had three or four trials, and me, me dad says, look, you're not going to make it, which makes you even more determined, and then I got a touchy look at Blackpool, um, and then he must have saw a little bit of a spark there, and then when I went to Wrexham, and my dad used to come, me, my uncles used to come and, and take my dad over and that, uh, and he actually spoke to the manager, and the manager said, uh, I've got high hopes for him. He said, look at the size of him. So um, the, the guys I was playing against, um, they felt it. Okay, you start your car. What we're going to do, I'm going to make you just drive. I just want you to keep driving in the straight line, straight forward. If I want you to turn, I'll give you plenty of warning. I don't have the key. I'll give you the key. Don't start. Bloody Chelsea supporters, there you go. <laughs> Clear. Handbrake off. If you're going to hit something, get something old and knackered. <laughs> Very nice. Tell me if there's anything behind you. No. How do you know? It's a lot from the mirrors. You check your mirrors. Yeah. So every single time you go into a new road, you need to check. Just remember, the last 20 metres, everything should yeah. be done. Mirrors, signal, position, speed, and look. So you get to here, you should be in the correct gear. Don't want that on. No, yeah. It should be in second gear. Because if you've looked long enough from far enough back, you can see everyone's going straight on. You don't need to be in first gear. Well done with your mirrors. Instructing is a lot of the time not over instructing. If somebody can do something, get on with it. And I'll pick up the, the sort of pieces that you're missing. I hate saying this, let's go past the pub. It seems like the only place I know is to find anywhere is with pubs. <laughs> Why am I still a driving instructor at 70? I've always been a worker, I've always liked working, um, and I found this job, and I lo absolutely love it. There's nothing better than going to somebody's house the first day, they get in the car, they have no idea what they're doing, they can't steer the car, they can't even turn the car on. Then a, a while later, a couple of months later maybe, they come back into the test centre and they go, I passed. And it's like, I've just scored again. And it, it feels, I'm buzzing for them because it's something, it's the most grown-up they, thing they will have done pretty much in their life up to now. And to be a part of it, who wouldn't want that? It's great for a, a knackered old footballer, you know, with bad knees and a dodgy hip. And I was taking Stephen Gerrard's daughter for a while and Leighton Baines, and it's great when Stephen comes out and he says, I hope you're patient. And of course I'm patient, I'm ever telling you, we haven't won anything for bloody years. And Bainesy comes out and he thumbs up. And then I got Duncan Ferguson's son. Unfortunately, I never got um, Lily Gerrard and, and Rhys Baines through the test, because I was in hospital. Probably with the first time you ever kicked a ball. It's on this corner. There was times when there was no money at all. We didn't, and you'd go and borrow money for next door. There used to be like the, uh, the meters that you had. There was a, an electric meter or a gas meter. So sometimes you'd be there and the, the meter would go, so you'd have no electricity. And if your dad hadn't worked, because you weren't assured a job, you had to go there and queue to see if they'd give you work that day. There could be a hundred men, they called it the, uh, the, 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 the pen. And there'd be a hundred men all looking for work. And then you had the, the guys with the bowler hat saying, you, you and you. So you'd probably only get maybe 20 men working. So there was 80 men coming home uh, with no money. So it was um, difficult, but then years later, you know, things get better. My dad got a better job. He worked on a, for a company up the road, a container base, and um, things looked up. You now we did, did the best they could, you know, and, and, and my mum used to work in that. And yeah, it was very, very rare that you'd be without. They always made sure you had something to eat and make sure that the, you know, the electricity, we were probably one of the first houses around here to, in the street to have a television. And um, remember people coming to watch the, the World Cup and stuff at the house. But it was, uh, it, was a, it was a tough place to live. 
but um, there was always somebody looking out for you. My last year at Middlesbrough, I, I was surplus to requirements, and they put up me, I think, for, for the full season. I played a few games and scored a few goals, important goals, but we got relegated. So at the end of the season, the manager said to me, um, I'm letting you, letting you go. When you're told that you're no good, you, well, you, you're getting a free transfer from, from Middlesbrough, you're going. We don't need you anymore. Um, that's like a real kick in the stomach. And it's like, am I really that bad? And then Heine Otto, I will be forever grateful to Heine for passing my name over. And then instead of just going to Enskede and just doing two years and, and picking a wage pack up or, and just and then leaving and then people saying, well, yeah, he was all right, but he wasn't great. I was there for three years and I've still got people texting me and, and messaging me on Twitter and Facebook. Um, you are my favorite player at Enskede. And it was like, they still remember me. So if I'm going from somewhere that didn't want you to somewhere that really, really liked you, you couldn't get any better than that. Koopman. Goeie beweging, buitenom, de voorzet is ook goed. Daar is Eskron. Oh, yeah. Schitterende goal. Van Gestel. Zocht het andere been, vond het niet. Vrijzen kan dat beter. Eskroft is daar en het is een goede kopbal. Willy Eskroft. Technically, I was looking at some of these players. I mean, I just come from, when I signed for Middlesbrough, we had Graeme Suness. Teddy Cooper, who was England international left back, Dave Armstrong, who was uh, played for England, gets to Enskede. I had no idea who these guys were, but then I played with them, and I thought this is going to be brilliant, and it wasn't. <laughs> it was terrible because we got relegated the first year. Alle lengte voor in bij de vrije trap van Van Gaal, en inderdaad het doelpunt van Sparta. Dat was de gelijkmaker en 1-1 was ook de uitslag van de wedstrijd tussen Twente en Sparta. Spiet, we hebben voor de wedstrijd gezegd dat we daarna terug zouden komen. Ik vraag je nu wat ik je toen ook vroeg. Hoe is het nu met FC Twente? Ja, hoe is het nu met FC Twente? Kijk, je hebt natuurlijk een punt verspeeld thuis, maar het is gewoon verder gaan. Then we changed managers and we changed tack and everything. Uh, Spitzkorn came in and then the lunatic Mr. Korbach, my favorite ever manager. He's just... And he changed it, changed me, changed the way we played, and we got promoted. Yes, we're in Wales. This now is Wales. Wrexham gave me the chance. I mean, I, I came to Wrexham as a 15, 16 year old, 15 years of age I was actually. Um, so I made my sort of first team debut here Scored my first goals here, got married when I was here, I married Pam. My first born was born in Liverpool, actually, but um, we were still living in Wales. So all my firsts have been done in Wrexham, first car, shot me driving test here. Um, the road was like this when I was here before, it's never been fixed. But yeah, it's, um, this is all my first, and it's got great memories. For me, pretty much, this is like coming home. There's the ground there. And this is the mice squint. Well, when was the last time you were, you were at the game then? At the um, last season. Yeah. I had surgery last year, so I, I couldn't get out, couldn't go to any games. Right. So even they gave me season tickets to put Everton. Oh, but, uh, which is good. I'm just saying, mate. Yeah. That's uh, probably for the best. Uh, right. What a special guest we have today. Uh, absolute honour. 273 games for Wrexham. 96 goals. The Yeti. Please make some noise for Mr. Billy Ashcroft. Uh, but Billy, uh, brought in by Wrexham, by John Neal, when you were 16 originally. How did it all, because you were at Everton before that as a kid, uh, was it Blackpool as well? How did that all come about in the first place? Uh, I actually wrote to uh, Everton for trials, and everything was going well until they seen me play. 
Yeah. Instant Tucker, Al Tayden Tucker, I think the phrase is. Um, it's a team that I, I do absolutely love. And embarrassingly, I've not been back, but I would love to go back and watch a game at uh, the Grolsche West. I was nine when we went to the Netherlands and it was a bit strange, to be honest. Um, I knew the Netherlands was a different country, but I didn't really know what to expect. And it was hard to get used to at the start. Language was the one big barrier, I suppose. But luckily I went to a Dutch school rather than an international school. So I was thrown into it, learning all day long. And then after school, I go and play with my friends outside. And it was just constantly practicing and practicing. And I got it very quickly, I think. At that age, you do really, don't you, at nine? We still use some Dutch words in the house. When we're talking about sweets, we always talk about snoop. And um, if, it, if there's a draft, you know, do the dirt, things like that. I thought this young um, Dutch lad there, Dyke Steel, I thought he went to Wrexham. It's his brother. Ah, okay. His brother was in the uh, the academy at uh, Middlesbrough. Anthony Dyke Steel, isn't it? Is he? Yeah, he's on the bench there. Good tackle, lad. Good tackle. What's he doing wearing bloody gloves? Won't last long in Middlesbrough, lad. You look at his midfield. They're playing exactly how he would have played. Get in there and make yourself available. I do miss that fire beside. Mm. Believe it or not, up until a year and a half, two years ago, I was still playing five-a-side football with my son, who's slightly younger than me, obviously. Um, but the guys that we were playing against were younger than him. I, I could hold me on with all of them. You know, I was, I was, you could tell I was an ex-professional. Um, then I started getting a few twinges, um, which slowed me down a little bit, which obviously I've never had speed anyway. Uh, and then I, I got a letter saying that you need to come and get your aorta checked. So it's, it's the valve that's just below your heart. Uh, and it was, it was fine, it was 4.5 centimetres and, or millimetres, whatever. And then they said, come in three months and get it checked. So it had gone from 4.5 to 4.6, and then it was 4.7. Oh, don't worry about it. When it gets to 5.5, then we'll start worrying about it. So over the next 12 months or so, it had gone from 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Then it was 5 point something. If it gets to 4.5, sorry, 5.5, 5.6, it could pop. It's like getting a balloon. So you blow a balloon up and it's like that. Then when you let it down, it's still the same shape. But once you've done it 10, 15, 20 times, it comes saggy and baggy. And that's what happens with the aorta. It becomes soft. And then if it pops, there's not a great deal you can do about it because it's like the whole thing just... <laughs> so it doesn't look great. Uh, I went down to Liverpool Hospital on the Thursday. My son took me down there. Uh, I had the operation, which was... Um, instead of cutting me there, they cut me from here, from the, my stomach, right the way around to the back. And then they got inside and pushed things to one side. I think he's left his golf clubs in there somewhere because it doesn't feel great. Um, so then they had like, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 stitches all the way around. So what they did was they... Um, clamped up here, clamped here, took this out, uh, took the parts out of a hoover and a clock and then they pieced them all together and sewed it back up, then stitched it in. Um, and now it's, it's, I don't know, a synthetic material. So I've got this little piece of whatever it is in there. I was in intensive care and I was in a coma for, I don't know, a couple of days or so. There's the park, so I didn't have far to come to actually get to play football. That's changed as well. That wasn't there when I was a kid. That building, this was just a park with trees right the way down the centre. I think I played my first game for the Salvation Army. Um, green shirts, which they supplied, and green shorts, but you needed green socks, and I didn't have any. So my mum took uh, a pullover and took the sleeves off a green pullover, sewed the bottoms, and I had to put that to wear them. It was really uncomfortable, but I played. That was my first game. I was rubbish. Yeah, 
Garston Park. That was the first time I ever played them in a proper match with two people with the two two teams with the, a strip, a football strip on. All started here. Yeah, I was lucky enough to play against Van Basten, Khalid, Rijkaard, the Koeman brothers. In fact, that's a Mark Marco Van Basten, and he never got a kick. <laughs> the three goals he scored were just complete <laughs> blues. Fritz came in, Fritz Kobach came in, and the first day we didn't get on. He said to me, he said, you're not fit. I was like, well, of course I'm not fit. I've been in Liverpool all the close season on the beer and been on the beach and stuff. So I said, listen, and I'm not going to tell you who the player was, but I said, you see him over there. He's, he looks like Bruce Lee. He's got the body and he can run all day. But when it comes to Christmas, He'll be on the, the bench getting treatment. I'll be the one digging you out of a hole. I'll score the goals for it. I thought, oh, what have you said? So in the afternoon, we come around, he said, sit down on the, on the, the grass. He said, I just want to apologise to Billy. Now, if you do that for me, we've got no problem. I said, I'd run through a brick wall for this guy. And I, said, I don't know what it was, 20 odd goals that season. So we became pretty close, you know. It was all about the club and, and making feel, people feel comfortable. I mean, coming over from England, it's like no transport. My car's back in England. And somebody took me out and said, I'll go and pick a car. So I'm driving down the Mercedes, and I've never had a Mercedes in my life. Do I need to pay? No, no, it's a, it's a present from us. Just score loads of goals. But I, being looked after like that, they didn't have a clue who I was. The voorzitter van Pelzer, Koopman. Goed Koopman op Seurensen. Goede beweging ook van Seurensen, daardoor los van zijn tegenstander. Sanchez Torres kiest precies op rechts en die is snel, maar Erkonis is het ook. Maar die slijding is niet goed. Schot! En dan Esbrook, goal! Goed werk van Sanchez Torres. Mooi afgerond door Billy Esbrook, die zijn negende goal scoort voor de FC Twente. Het was een home from home, until Sorensen turned up, Jan Sorensen. En hij was just one of the lads, you know what I mean? He phoned me up, do you feel like going for the beard? And if you had something to say, he'd listen to you and he'd sort of help you out with stuff. And um, it, was, it was a, I mean, strange walking down the road and, and all these people speaking this different language and I'm like, no idea. And then a couple of months later and that, you're walking down the road and you're picking little words up and, and then you start feeling like you're a part of it. Uh, and, and I said, the, the guys made, it, made me feel a part of it as soon as I got there. You just felt so comfortable and they couldn't do enough for you. The people of Enska, they couldn't do enough for you. I wrote for a trial to Tramia Rovers pretty much before I'd even had a proper game of football. And I got a trial over at Tramia. And to be fair, when the manager came out and said, uh, go back to school, son, you'll never make a footballer. Uh, he was absolutely right. But then it was like, how dare you say that to me? You know, you don't even know who I am. So then I got this ball uh, and I could wear a pair of shoes away in a season, you know what I mean? Just by kicking against the wall. Uh, and the great thing was I made my home debut against Tranmere and we beat them 4-1. And I, to be fair, I had a really good game for the young lad. And their manager came in, he said, um, well, I'm so glad you never listened to me. He said, I'm really pleased for you and your manager. I thought I was like big of him to actually say that. When I was a kid coming along here with um, me, me dad and my uncles and that, and I knew I was going the match, you were so excited. This is called Queen's Drive and it's the run to, to Old Goodison Park. And you could, your hair was tingling in the back of your head and you had like goosebumps. 
Yeah, we used to walk up. We'd come out one of the side roads. Then we'd walk up here and sometimes we'd go into the church because that's where the heritage society is and you buy your programmes and uh, memorabilia. And then we used to walk round the ground and we used to just bump into our mates. But it was like when you walk down there and you see that big crest up there. The travel to Blackpool was difficult. And my uncle used to take me all the time. Uh, it was difficult for him, so I said to him, look, uh, I've got a trial with Wrexham in Liverpool because they had this, this guy in Liverpool who was the scout. So I played in the practice match and this guy said, yeah, I'm quite like him, he's a big lad and he puts himself about. Um, so I was there for a couple of weeks training and the next thing I get through the, the post, you're playing for the, the, the Wrexham B team on the Saturday. So I went up on the Saturday we won 5-2, I scored two goals, and I think the following week I was in the reserves playing against Penman Mauer from up the, the Welsh coast. Uh, and the guy who was marking me, I must have been 16 maybe at the time, was a, a Welsh wrestler called Orig Williams. He was a nasty piece of work, Orig. Uh, I'm 16, we get a corner, Orig's marking me, and he's got me in a headlock doing this. Unfortunately, we had a, a, a scouser playing for us called Joey Duncan and he started giving Orig verbals. So Orig left me and he chased Joey around the stadium. And I got away with murder that day. But um, that's when John Neal said to me, when you finish the school, I'm gonna sign you on, as a, on, a, on the ground staff as an apprentice. I played for Blackpool, Brexham, Middlesbrough and FC20, retired. It was a pleasure to play in this team. We had a freedom, we could do what we want. The boss would just, you go play football, go. There's not a great deal of tactics, but it was just, go and enjoy yourself. We're not paying you much, but you can go and enjoy yourself. Brilliant. So FC20 where you go to, and to this day are revered as a cult hero. One of the first, I guess, English players to go, got to play against like Johan Cruyff, Frank Rijkaard, Marco van Basten, Ruud Hollett, Johnny Rep, these sort of players. How was all of that for you? That was fantastic. I mean, yeah, I was lucky enough to play against the old school, like um, Cruyff and that sort of era, and then played against uh, van Basten, Hollett, Rijkaard, the Koeman brothers. In fact, that's a mark, Marco van Basten, and he never got a kick. <laughs> the three goals he scored were just complete flukes. <laughs> Let me tell you. He thought I was slightly crazy over there. So they'd have the, the, the name, and they always left me to last, and he'd say, number seven is Martin Copeman, uh, numero acht, uh, Manuel Sanchez Torres. Numero negen. The Gekka Engels, the crazy Englishman, Hillbilly Ashcroft, and I was like, any need? <laughs> but uh, I mean, they took to me really, really well. I mean, I still got loads and loads of friends over there, and I'd love to go back, but I can't even make it to the end of the road, never mind, to Holland. I found it very strange because I dropped him off at the hospital that morning, came back home, logged into work, and by the time I finished work, he was in a coma. And it was just, my head was spinning for a few days, thinking, how has this happened? It was supposed to be a routine operation. So just for that first couple of weeks, my mum was in a terrible state. Everyone that was coming to the house, seeing how we were, thinking the same thing, thinking that just, it doesn't sound good. Good effort. That would annoy me, that though. You've gone down the line, the fanny and about, and all you've got to do is put a ball into yeah. the bloody far post. Do you know, it's like dancing, it's like come dancing, the way they put their arms on you and nothing happens. Jesus. All those defenders in the box and that one person was picking him up, that's ridiculous. They're not challenging him, they're putting the bloody arms on him and dancing. That's poor defending. Yeah, fair enough, good goal. I don't think Carrick will be happy with that though. Good tackle, lad. Good Whoa. tackle, he's hurt himself though. Like an episode of M.A.S.H. <laughs> Good ball. Get 
Get in. Oh, what good goal that was. <laughs> just what he's just done there, going to the crowd. You couldn't describe that. The feeling you get, everything, your head's just going to explode. I just wish one more time to put a shirt on and go and play some, but even five aside, I just love it. Well, I've kept hold of my me, uh, me last pair of indoor boots, just in case. I know, I've still got mine, I'm never going to use them. You never know. I've got a pair of shorts, but they're not going to fit me anymore. Give it a few months, it might fit me. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to play five aside now anyway because of this operation. So I just think, yeah, I can't overdo anything. It was the first time in my entire life where he wasn't like a superhero. He wasn't Superman. Suddenly he became. He's just he's just a man, and it was difficult to take, and it was hard to get my head around just for a few weeks at least. But I always had faith that he's a really strong character, so I knew he'd come through it. Even if it did, at times, keep me awake at night, it was worrying, it was, I knew deep down, if anyone was going to get through it, it was him. I, I came out of intensive care, I was on morphine for the pain, and I thought, I'm, I can't be doing it, I'm not taking drugs like that. So I said to him, can you stop the morphine, I don't want that, I'll just have, Grolsch will do anything, a painkiller. Uh, so I was on um, some painkilling tablets and that. But it's just knackered me completely. Um, I get out of breath. It's, it's, I wouldn't say debilitating, but what's happened now is it's, my legs have started to go a little bit and the knees. But um, it's painful now because I say I've got a lump on the side and it's when you sit for so long. But once again, you've got to look on the bright side of life, haven't you? It's like, I, I, I might not be here. And yet I'm still here now telling you how this went. So the alternative to that is just doesn't bear thinking about. Any final words for the fine folks at the Wrexham? It's unbelievable. The support here now. I remember coming to a match five or six years ago when I said to the fellow that was next to me, went, hey, it's quiet here, mate, isn't it? <laughs> now you can't get a seat. So yeah, I mean, it's down like we've got two games left now that we've got to win and it's down to you guys to just keep them going. The last game I came to was, um, somebody said to me, the gaffer wants to see you. So I thought, Christ, I'm getting the bollock in. <laughs> <laughs> Can he still find me? We don't play for <laughs> That's the only time I get took into an office. So I goes down and I'm pleased to meet you, gaffer. He says, I'm a big fan. I went, oh, it's a wind up. <laughs> but he said, no, and he got me a parking space outside the, uh, the that was fabulous. And I was speaking about like what's got us there, and he said the support. How can you get the support done? So you guys just keep it going. Thank you, everyone, for the Thank you, me. You made me very happy growing up. I tell you, mate. Um, Thank you. Fantastic. Cheers. You were here or you were gone, tell you? No way. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh you're welcome. Yes. Can we have your photo? Of course you can, yeah. I always talk about being a pub football team. And everyone says, you're a bit um, derogatory about your football team, aren't you? I said, no, what I mean about a football team, if you've got a pub football team, it's all the lads that drink in the pub who live locally and they're all mates together. The players now, one lives in over there, one lives two miles, 30 miles, but you never see each other unless they're going for a game. But at, in Enskede, we were together, we were bonded, we went for beers together. Uh, and then when we came onto the pitch, we used to back each other up all the time. And, and callback was like, that's we get stuck into each other. Uh, and with some of the players that we had, you know, we were good to watch as well. The likes of Rene Road coming to the squad, he was just unbelievable. I mean, he could, put a, a, a cross in from the dugout and still find you. Roort, moet die voorzet komen. En het hoofd van Ashcroft, mooie draaibal! Ja hoor! Uh, Eva Blumen became this incredible player. Manuel was always Manuel. Uh, and Sorensen, he just dictated. He was probably the best player in the league at the time. And I was scoring goals. Dan nu die hoekschop van Michael Birkedaal op Jan Seurensen. In het strafschopgebied nu, voorzet. 
Ashcroft koppen, doelpunt. Mooie goal van Billy Ashcroft. Verleden jaar, met Feyenoord er zelfs bij, kwamen bij de eerste vier thuiswedstrijden van Twente 29.000 mensen kijken. Dan zou je zeggen, als ze dan naar de eerste divisie gaan, dan wordt dat minder. Zeker als je tegenstanders hebt als uh, SVV, Herakles, NAC, NEC. Maar niks daarvan. Meer mensen in de eerste vier thuiswedstrijden dan verleden jaar zelfs. Waar staat hij in het hart van de RBC-defensie? Voor zijn schop is genomen. Ashcroft kapt, doelpunt. Ja hoor, Billy Ashcroft. Ashcroft koppend, doelpunt. Ja, ja. Keurige voorzet van Tony McNulty op het hoofd van Billy Ashcroft. 10 minuten na rust, 2-0. I just, I, I even think, when I was a kid, I was about 8, 9 years of age. And I was thinking, or I've never played football before, but if one of them gets injured and they need somebody from the crowd, they could look around and go, that ginger fellow will do. You still feel like that now. You know, if you, if you turn up and one of them's injured, Billy will play. I know he can't walk. He's 70, he's got a belly on him, but he's, he'll play, he'll have a go. Just to wear that Everton shirt. I didn't ever want to leave Wrexham because of anything else, except for I wanted to play at places like this, like Goodison Park or Old Trafford or Main Road. That's what I wanted to do. And this, is the, I mean, this was the highlight of my life playing here. Walking out into that pitch like I used to, like I used to stand at this end, at that end, and I used to look and see these players coming out, and especially night matches, and I have to do it, and I, I just, I lived the dream. So it would have been 1977 to 82 that I played here against Everton. And we came here and we beat them 2-0, beat Everton 2-0. I keep saying beat us 2-0, but I was playing for Middlesbrough, so I was us with Middlesbrough, but we beat Everton 2-0. It's a, it's a proud club. And it's just fading fast. What's this? Camera. Evertonian. No, nah, not really. They've both on me. What are you doing around here? I don't know. Play around here. Are you any good? Yeah, heavy. You're going to play for Liverpool? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to play for Liverpool in order. Not Everton. No. Horrible them. They won't be in the same division. <laughs> yeah, no. We'll be in the Premier League. They'll be nice. What do you mean they? That's us. I support it doesn't these. Matter. It doesn't matter. Like Liverpool, like they'll be in Premier League still, then you'll just be like, not to be seen in there. I can see it coming off, can't you? I can see it coming as well. You haven't got any decent plays we can borrow? No, not really. What about you? What are you doing next Saturday? Um, don't know, I'm probably lying in bed. <laughs> you wouldn't wear an Everton shirt, would you? No, not really. I hope you make it one day, kid. I will. I'll be looking out for you. Nice one. Fantastic. Callback said, um, I want you to stay for another season. I said, well, I don't know. He said, I'll give you more money or I said, it's not the money. I'm, I'm starting to feel that little bit of pains. And, oh, don't you see, you won't, I won't play here every single game. and You won't have to train every day. I said, well, that'll do for me. So I went back for one more season. Uh, and I was only a bit part player. I didn't play in most, a lot of games. So, yeah, we had, well, I signed for two years and I stayed for one more year. So yeah, it says volumes for how much we enjoyed it. Escroft and Walderbos. It is Escroft die wint. And it is Bleuming with Malbezit. It is a goal point ook. It begins by the winst van Escroft. I still think the Netherlands, that was his best time. When he was playing in England, if he was playing up front, I know we played as a centre half for some of the time, but the ball would be kicked long to him and he'd have to head it down. But as FC Twente, you had Manuel Sanchez Torres and Eva Blooming, who were putting crosses in constantly. And he did score a lot of headers, so uh, it must have worked wonders while he was there. Yes! Oh, what a great goal, lad. Well done, lad. Superb. Did he put it between the keeper's legs? Looks like it. Very, very calm. Superb, lad. What a great finish. I mean, if put a score, yeah, you're jumping up. You, you've got the same with Everton, Wrexham, 20. Not Liverpool. If Liverpool scored, it's like... Yeah, not happy with them. Oh, what, oh, a, what goal. a goal. It's come out of absolutely nowhere. What a finish. Absolutely spot on. 
as a family, we've not had the best of luck. So, uh, but we can't let things get us down. So, typical being my dad, no matter what he does, nothing will get him down. He will fight through anything, whether it's a centre half, whether it's um, heart problems, whether it's anything like that. He's a real fighter, and as someone that I, growing up, I, I looked up to, and I still, at the age of 50, I still look up to him. I've had a stroke. I was lying in a hospital bed for two months. And I could have felt sorry for myself, but I would have never walked again. Or people would have had to look after me constantly. Whereas now, I've pushed myself and pushed myself, and I look at it as a positive thing. I've been given a second chance. I think when you talk about the way I am, he's the same. What he said was, it's happened. I've got to get on with it. But yeah, I'm, pr I'm proud of my family completely, yeah. Just loving life at the moment, you know, because it's like, You've been given extra time, you know what I mean? It just, if, if it didn't go well, this is the time you've been given. Come on, man, blow your whistle. Go on. Yeah. Well done, but and lights are gone out. Great three points. I knew my limitations. I, I've never thought I was, I was a top-class footballer. I played with top-class players who helped me and made me look decent. Don't forget, I never played football until it was very late. So to actually get 20 years out of the game and, and, and thinking you're going to end up on the docks, it's one of those things where it's like, are you proud of what you did? Oh, gee, right, with the, with the ability I had, which wasn't massive, I did big things. And I, yeah, I'm so proud. Again, well done for avoiding the potholes. They're like swimming pools around here. <laughs> well done, you checked your mirrors that time because I noticed. So what your position you're playing that you're in midfield again? Uh, now I've been put back on a wing, left wing. So they're getting you further and further over to the bench? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> Splinters in your backside. Uh, I played yesterday for the uh, for the other Talton team. Oh yeah. In the fourth division. One two one. Did you score? I did. Yeah, I scored the winning goal. You scored the winning goal. Yeah. Is there any proof? Because you seem to score every bloody week, and I never seem to see it. <laughs> I love it. How many lessons you had? Nine. So you're driving like that after nine lessons? Yeah. It's fantastic that, I mean, I've got people that I had in the car are not as good as that after 20 lessons. So it's nice to have somebody who, who can listen. Okay, you support the wrong football team, but <laughs> we can put up with that, I suppose. It's fun. Fun, fun of Billy. He's a nice, nice, nice man. He's got to say that because he's seeing my granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I've just got this thing, it's like somebody tells you you can't do something. It's how dare you. Okay, how do you know what I can and can't do? I'm going to prove you wrong. And that's, that's all you do, prove people wrong. My dad, his career, his football career was down to optimism. That being told, you're not going to make it. Yes, I will. Unless you've got that optimism and that drive, I don't think you get anywhere in life. <laughs>